All right, welcome everybody to a brand new week of Computer Science 41, data structures in C++. Um, I'm just gonna shrink my screen a little bit and show you guys some of the answers to uh, imaginary homework. So, <clears throat> uh, when you have your operators done right, your, your main actually gets to look really nice. Like this actually looks very close to the calculator code, simple calculator, like, your first real homework assignment, like back in like CSI 40, right? If the user typed in a plus, then you output the plus of the two things. If they typed in a minus, you return the minus of the two things. So by using operators, you're able to have code that works just like an integer. Um, this is a little bit different here <clears throat> because the uh, exponent operator doesn't mean exponent. Here it means exponent, but normally in C++, that is not the exponent operator. That is, in fact, the XOR operator. The bitwise XOR operator does not do what you think if you try doing it with integers, but we're overloading it to make it act like an exponent. Now, you might be wondering, why do I have uh, these uh, parentheses around it? Well, <laughs> let's see what happens if I take those parentheses off. It is a, There is an order of operations issue here. So... The double left shift, the double left arrow is a left shift operator, and this is a XOR bitwise operator. These are both bitwise operators, and so um, C++ used the double left arrow. Um, maybe not a great idea. I don't know. Uh, because there is, there's definitely an order of operations problem here. So how this evaluates, it evaluates actually like this, uh, because they're all basically equal um, priority in order of operations, it will first try C outing the operand. And then what does C out, what does a double left arrow operator return? You guys have all written double left arrow operators before. What does it, what does this, what is this going to return? This highlighted area here. What variable is returned from that expression? What do you guys think? I got a uh, caramel macchiato. Mm -hmm. Nope, not first operand. Let's take a look <laughs> at the uh, complex.cc. Let's take a look at our double left arrow operator. What gets returned there? We're passing in C out for the O stream because the type of C out is O stream. It's an output stream. And we're passing in first operator as the right hand side. We got a double left arrow. The left hand side is C out. The right hand side is first operator. What is returned from this expression? Hmm, C out is returned. Right. So uh, when we uh, when we have this order of operations problem here, this is what this is how it parses it. If you don't have any parentheses, it parses it like this. And it returns from C out double left arrow first operand, it returns C out. And then it's going to give you an error saying there is no operator defined with an O stream on the left hand side and a um, complex on the right hand side. And probably some of you guys saw that error message. So what you need to do to solve that is just put parentheses this way. Then what happens is that this whole thing here uh, will evaluate to uh, another complex number. And then it will do the C out with that complex number that returns C out it does C out with N line. That's why the double left arrow operator returns an O stream. It, it allows you to chain together multiple C out statements. So like this whole thing here, C out first operand and second operand, all that evaluates to be C out. And then what's remaining C out double left arrow N line, all that evaluates to C out. And so it allows you to combine together multiple C out statements on one line. But the downside is um, if you have a situation like this where, um, the operator in the middle here is a bitwise operator, then it will not um, work. You gotta put parentheses around. Okay. So that is kind of our topic for today. Our topic for today actually is um, debugging. Okay. So we've got uh, a, a lecture, actually. I got a PowerPoint presentation, believe it or not. I use these occasionally um, on debugging. And uh, this is a skill that every computer science major needs to know. Because if you know how to debug, 
you make a mistake, you fix it, you move on. You are a highly productive individual. If, however, you make a mistake and it takes you eight hours to figure out the mistake, you have written one line of code in eight hours. It's not the writing of the code that's the hard part. It's the debugging of it that is the hard part that eats up all of your time. And there's a couple um, different categories of bugs that we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about, I can just full screen this, I guess. Oop. There we go. Uh, so there's three different kinds of bugs we're going to talk about, and I'm going to um, show you guys some techniques and, and strategies for dealing with each of them. Okay, And they're kind of arranged from uh, least complicated to most complicated and, and some uh, uh, approaches for, for solving them. Because ultimately, that's really what... There, there's a couple things that really divide experienced programmers from new programmers. One of them is the use of the standard library. If you ask me to randomly sh shuffle a vector, I will just call random shuffle and move on with my life. Whereas a new programmer is like, well, I should write that myself. Um, and they'll spend like a week working on it when they, it's completely unnecessary. It's just completely unnecessary work. You can just call the standard library routine and just get on with your life. Uh, so using the standard library, knowing what's been done already, on a similar vein, knowing what algorithms have been done before, like how to find the shortest path between two points, how to find the maximum flow of pipes in a network, how to find, um, you know, the biggest element in a uh, sorted vector, or how to search, do binary search through a sorted vector. All of these things are known problems that have known answers that are that are good. Not no answer, known answers that are good. And a experienced computer science person's like, oh, that's just binary search, bloop, and you just knock it out, you know, and you move on with your life. Whereas the an experienced person will try implementing it all from scratch. And the third big area is this: um, you'll you'll write uh, some code, you'll get confused by an error message, and you'll dig yourself deeper and deeper. Um, over Thanksgiving, I went to the La Brea Tar Pits, and uh, that's a pretty good analogy for like compiler errors. Um, for new computer science people. They just flounder and get deeper and deeper into it. So my code doesn't work. I have no idea why my code works. I have no idea why. Yeah, um, that's not a good situation to be in. It's really not. Like why, you know, why did that parentheses solve the thing? Like there's, there's knowledge. Like computer science is, you know, there's a knowledge base you build up and you just got to put the time in and, and stuff like that. But the good news is I'm here for you guys. So if you if you wanted to know why you need parentheses around that uh, carrot, then I can explain it because I I know some things. Okay, uh, not all of them. Like I like in terms of total computer science, I know like a small fraction of it. You know, like it's a big field. But like this kind of stuff, I got your back. All right. So debugging is fixing uh, erroneous programs. Uh, you all know what debugging means. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, it's really a productivity issue. Like, for me, like, a big part of programming is just being productive. You know, I just, I want to not waste my time when I'm programming. I want to be able to sit there and write code and test it and get it working and solve the problem and move on with my life. I hate it when I sit there and spin my wheels and stare at the thing and I can't figure out why it's not working. And it's just the worst feeling in the world. And so hopefully after today's lecture, you guys will have less of the worst feeling in the world and more of the happy joy of computer science. Because remember, all of computer science boils down to just two psychological phenomena, imposter syndrome and narcissism. So when it's not working, it's imposter syndrome. I don't belong here. I am the worst. Everybody else knows more than me. Why am I even here? And then when it works, it's narcissism. Like I am the greatest. I am invincible. You know, that's basically all of computer science in a nutshell. If you can boil it down to two, two emotions. <laughs> and if you don't experience the joy of solving a, a problem, then it's probably not a good feel for you because you're going to get all the negatives and none of the, none of the emotional positives from, from solving a, a challenging problem. The dual, the duality of man. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> bit of a, bit of a, bit of a, uh, a bit sarcastic, but also, a lot of truth in that. Okay, so uh, there are three different categories of bugs we're going to talk about today. And the first one is the compiler bug. The second one is the logic bug. Your, your code compiles and it runs, but it doesn't run correctly. 
And the third thing is a Byzantine era. And Byzantine errors are the uh, the nemesis of programmers everywhere. Your program sometimes runs, right? Um, your variables change without you changing the variables. Uh, they are a whole lot of no fun. We'll start with the easy ones. So we're going to start with compiler bugs, okay? So uh, as just a, a really basic overview, when you get a compiler error, it looks like this. Test 4.cc, uh, colon 13, colon 1. Uh, Cunningham, what does this mean? When you when you compile your code and you get you get an error message that says test 4.cc colon 13 colon 1 colon. There's a lot of colons there. What what does this mean? What are these three things here? This and this and this. Uh uh put me on the spot. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I do not know. Great. So the first thing here is the file that you're compiling. So there's an error in the file called test4.cc. The 13 here is the line number. That is line 13 that the compiler thinks the error is on. Now, as it turns out, it's, it's not. It's not on line 13. But that's where the compiler thinks the error is. And then this is character 1. So the very, very leftmost character on the line, on line 13, there's an error. And the error that we got was we expected a semicolon before we got to a close brace. So what does this mean, everybody? If you get a line uh, 13 error expected a semicolon before a curly brace, what does that mean in plain English? You didn't put a semicolon on line 13 or a Greek uh, question mark. Uh, actually, no, it actually doesn't mean that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it kind of means that, but not really, not exactly, I should say. So like if I, let's say I forget the semicolon here, right? It's going to give me an error. I expected a semicolon after a class definition. Great error message, by the way. Uh, C++, to its credit, the compilers in C++ have gotten much better. They have. C++ is famous for having bad error messages, but I've actually like talked to the people that make Kling, and I'm like, could you please make these better for my for my beginning students, please? And this is actually like it's got colors now. It's got it, it actually shows you like right here, we would expect a semicolon, puts a little arrow there. It says, hey, you should probably have a semicolon there. Like this is like head and shoulders better than what it was even like six or seven years ago. Like Every iteration of Clang in G++ has actually made error messages better. Okay, so if we go back in there, uh, this is telling us on line 21, character 2, right, character 1 would be the semicolon. Character 2, that's where we're expecting a semicolon. And I can actually open up main to line 22, look at this, like that. If I do that, this is going to open up main.cc on line 22, or I can make it 21, but okay, sure. And so there is where it's telling me the, the semicolon's missing. Okay. Uh, but if you look at Commander of Conqueror, it actually is putting the error here. You see that? Because it doesn't know that it needs a semicolon until something happens that the semicolon would have to come before. And so whenever you get these like missing semicolon errors, a lot of times they're on the next line. Okay, or in this case, it might even be like, it, it might even be like 10 lines down, right? Like it's highlighting that line as the one that is erroneous, but it's not. And so a lot of beginning students especially will, st will stare at this and they're like, okay, well, I need to get a semicolon up in here. So I'm going to put a semicolon uh, here. There we go. It's, uh, it's, no, uh, no, nope, still, still buggy. Unexpected unqualified ID. Oh dear. Okay. Um, uh, unqualified ID. How about that? Is that going to work? Nope, that didn't work. A type specifier is required. Okay, shoot. Um, a, and, and it's a type specifier. Does that work? No. Nope. Wait, we got a bug over here now. Expected a semicolon after class. Okay. I just gave you a semicolon, man. Okay, we'll do we'll do that. Okay, now we got a bear, now we got a bug here in for loop. Do you see what I mean about the tar pit? If you don't understand what the error messages are, and if you don't understand that a lot of times it'll give you an error on the line below where the actual mistake is, 
you can sit there and just start changing things and just break your code over and over again and make it worse and worse and worse every time trying to make these error messages go away. Um, and it's, it's floundering in the tar pit. It is not good. Okay. Expected an expression. Okay. Uh, five plus two, that's an expression, right? Uh, no, that didn't work. Expected a close. Okay. Let's try that. Let's do that. Nope. That didn't work. Uh, expected another semicolon. Okay. Sure. Here's another semicolon. Okay. Uh, extraneous closing brace. Okay. Let's get rid of you then. Um, Right, you, you will just sit there and you can make changes forever if you don't know what you're doing. That is not how you should be coding. Okay, you need to, you need to get down with the sickness as the disturbed band put it. If you have an error message here about a missing semicolon, it's oftentimes the line above it, right there that you need to fix. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a big problem if you forget if you forget this in a in a in a header file when you include it. Remember, it copies and pastes the entire header file in, and you're getting errors in like sometimes like you know completely distant locations because you have a missing semicolon over here. So um, just watching you do this is giving me anxiety. Yeah, imagine being a professor. <laughs> <coughs> You got you to you gotta get used to this. Okay, uh, another another very common uh, mistake that people will make is, uh, <laughs> uh, let's just purge all this. Uh, somebody give me the name of a class. And we'll put the name down here. Class, class, bruh, sure. All right, and uh, okay. So let me let me show you how not to make a class. Okay, so tell me about the bra class, Megan. Uh, what kinds of things uh, describe a bra class? What member variables does it have? What functions should it have? This kind of stuff. Uh, let's see here. I'm just going to. I'm going to actually leave all this stuff in here for a reason. And then Corelli like commented out all that. <laughs> What's going on here? What is happening here? Okay. Um, bug physics for a gosh, I should never volunteer. Bra moments, vine booms. Okay. So we're going to have a class called bra. And watch the wrong way of, of making this. The right way of making this is every time you make an open curly brace, you make the closed curly brace. And you put the semicolon there. It's called the hamburger method. Okay? I learned this from my professor in college. Every time you have an open uh, if uh, you know open parentheses, you don't just start writing stuff. No. No. You do the open, you do the closed, you do the open, you do the closed like that, then once you got the buns of your hamburger ready, then you put the stuff on the inside, right? You don't just take peanut butter and smear it on the table. Like people get annoyed at you when you do that, okay? You wanna have symmetry, right? You create your open and closed at the same time, then you go in the middle and do the filling, okay? You guys understand? Get the bread, you get your bread, and then you do the middle. You don't just dump the ham and turkey and mayo on the kitchen counter. So, uh, <laughs> it's like milk before the cereal. Yeah. Or milk before the bowl. <laughs> okay. So when, when you write your stuff, you need to make the matching braces because here's what happens if you don't. Okay. So we've got that and then we're going to have a uh, name, a little, okay. String name, uh, float ridiculousness, uh, number of memes and memes. Okay. Then we're gonna have a public section, and then and then we're gonna have a constructor, right? Called bra, and uh, then we're gonna have another constructor that takes uh, three parameters: string, new name, uh, float, new ridiculousness, uh, int new memes. Open curly boy. Do you guys see what's happening here? 
<laughs> so I am missing uh, one, two, three closes at this point. Uh, I'm missing one close parentheses. I'm missing two closed curly braces. I'm missing a semicolon. And students just try writing it all from the top to the bottom. And like by the time you're like three levels deep like this, like you are not going to shovel yourself out. Like you are buried in it. And so they're like, all right, well, I should just test my code now. All right. Like new name, uh, you know, name equals new name. And maybe I'll try like an initializer list up here or something, you know, ridiculousness equals new ridiculousness. Why not? And I'm going to forget a comma. So memes equals new memes. And I'm going to forget to close parentheses and eh, we'll, we'll close this one off here. Okay. So. When your formatting gets screwed up like this, this is a sign from the gods that you have offended them. Okay? <laughs> Please no more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a sign that you have displeased the Vim gods. Okay? Um, and you guys don't even have Commander of Conquer, but Vim will tell you, like, through the formatting, that you done goofed. Okay? So at this point, let's try compiling this code and see what happens, right? So let's just let's just try this right now. Okay. All right. We expected a uh, colon before bra. Okay, that's actually that's actually reasonable. Why not? Let's do that. Now, if I reformat my code, and the command to reformat, by the way, is like you can actually type reformat, like like you can actually reformat in.cc. That's a shell script I made. Um, but in Vim, the reformat command is good game equals capital G. So GG equals capital G. And uh, the reformat command is actually the equal sign. So the equal sign means reformat. GG takes you to the top of the file. Shift G takes you to the bottom of the file. So this is reformatting the entire file. So if I GG equals capital G, look at that formatting. Man, look at that go. That is not good. If you see like print like that far off the screen, boy, howdy, have you screwed up. We're like, I don't know how many missing like parentheses and curly braces and stuff like that. Scroll down. Here's main. Like main is just like in the middle of the screen. That is not a good sign. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's actually how I find my, uh, my missing uh, curly braces and things like that. Um, so if you see the indentation break where it shouldn't be like this, that's a sign that I screwed up there. Okay. Um, don't like, don't be this student. And there's always a student that tries this, right? They'll try compiling it. Expected a close bracket at the end of the input. Okay, line 67. It needs to match this one. Okay. I trust you, compiler. I am gonna ch I am gonna put a close right there. There we go. Solved. We now have a matching curly brace to go with bruh. There it is. Everything's fine now. And it'll even tell us, you know, to put a semicolon there. There it is. Okay, there we go. Hmm. Okay, uh, what's the problem now? Now that I just sort of randomly slapped a curly brace at the end of the file. Where is main now? What class is main in? Bruh. Exactly. Main is now in bruh. So you have just made a main function inside of bruh. And even if this did compile, which it won't, um, you won't have a main anymore because your main is now accidentally included in a class because you just randomly slapped a curly brace down somewhere because like we're missing some, so we'll just add some and like hope it works. Um, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, we need another curly boy. Okay. All right. Well, we, we can keep, I can keep this up all day. There we go. Compile it again. Need another one. Okay. Let's keep doing this. Whatever. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
Like I said, it's a tarpit. It really is a tarpit. Okay. You do not want to write code that way. Okay. When you write your open bracket, write the closed bracket. So even if like you forget or like a dog distracts you and you like go play with the dog, you come back, you're not in a place where your code looks like this. You should never have your code look like this. Um, ever. When you when you write your your open and close brackets, do them together and then do the middle part later. Uh, because then your code will always compile. You're not gonna like people will be like, well, I don't know, like maybe I'll put a close bracket here. That seems like I could use one. And now this print function is now part of the broad class when it shouldn't be. Like you have to be very like you have to actually know which which bracket's missing, right? And so uh, the indentation here shows us, right? So I can look over here and see, aha, I am missing a parentheses there. GG equals capital G. Look, I fixed one, Ma. Check me out. Okay. Um, the uh, shift five operator will show you the matching bracket. Um, we still got something going on here that's bad. And that is another mat missing parentheses there. And new means doesn't exist because uh, we need a comma there. G equals capital G. It's getting there. It's getting there. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, bra. Yep. Bra is indented there. G equals capital G. Boom. Uh, print is now still part of the bra class. That's not good. And so you can use the indentation method to see if you're... Um, if you screwed up, okay? Just reformat your code, look where everything is like, looking like Python all of a sudden, you know, where everything's indented five levels deep. And uh, and that's your sign, that's where I screwed up, okay? So, <laughs> unexpected white space error, exactly. So, uh, let's say we're gonna write a, um, I don't know. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Make a function here called like I don't know int exponent integer a integer b and I'm gonna write this the wrong way again. Okay, so for integer i equals a i is less than b i plus plus. Do you get? Do you guys see how like you should feel like a little bit like? It's kind of like when, when somebody starts a song and they don't finish it, right? Like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear. I'm not finishing it. That's what it should sound like when you have the um, these open curly braces without a matching one. It's like, you should have that same level of like, I need resolution here. Like you should not feel good having any open, unmatched curly brackets or any other kind of bracket, a parentheses, angle bracket, none of them. They should always, always, always be closed. Okay, don't write code like this where we're just like doing stuff like integer total equals one and total times equals a and Right. Do you see how we've got like two outstanding curly braces? Don't do this. Don't do this. <clears throat> For a second, you thought my internet died. Nope. I am just torturing my students. Uh, because like you have that, that moment of like, ah, just finish the song. Like I need the resolution here. And so you should have that same feeling when you have the curly braces here and here. Okay. Um, I, I'm waiting for the closed bracket. I'm like, come on. Okay, so don't write code like that. Instead, write code like this. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna show you the hamburger method. And if you use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, it does this for you instantly. So you make the open bun, you immediately make the closed bun, and then Shift O opens the inside. Okay, bun bun. Then you're gonna slap patty in the middle. Cheese, lettuce, whatever. Okay, we're gonna do a for loop. Cool. All right, for loop time. For integer i equals zero, let's say i is less than b, i plus plus, open curly brace, close curly brace, shift o to go into the middle. Okay, the buns are there. I'm now going to work on the meat. 
if a dog distracts me, it's like, I need to go outside and, and be walked. It's like, all right, cool. You know, I walk away. I hope I haven't screwed up anything else in that. Um, warning. Yeah, like this function's not working, but like see my code compiles. I, I didn't accidentally make main part of my class. It'd be terrible, you know. So, um, yeah, I actually, I actually don't like it because I use the hamburger method myself. I don't like it when it makes it for me. Uh, cause I usually know better than it, what, where, and when I want those things. So then I can come in here and maybe write some bad code. I want to compute, uh, compute a to the beef power. Okay. So maybe I could say like a is equal to times equals a. How about that? So if we compute two squared, this is gonna, I don't know, not be right. You disable bracket completion, yeah. And then we will like return it. How about this? Okay. So this is gonna bring us to the topic of logic bugs, okay? Because this code is not doing exponentiation correct, not at all. No sir, in no way is this code correct. Uh, probably if A is zero or one, it'll work. <laughs> For any other number, it's not gonna work. Okay. Oh yeah. And if you have uh, lots and lots and lots of compilers, um, there is uh, one trick that doctors hate that I can show you. So uh, let's say we wanted to make a giant compiler error. Try see outing a vector sometime. <clears throat> that doesn't work. C++ does not know how to output a vector. So if you try see outing a vector, which um, you'd be reasonably expected that that would work, right? Like in Java uh, script, in JavaScript, you can just see out a vector and it'll just print something for you that's probably reasonably okay. Uh, C++ does not have that for you. You have to make your own, um, you have to make your own print function, right? Like I did uh, on, on Friday. If you try compiling this, oh, you get error messages. You get error messages for days. Look at this. These, error these aren't even error messages. They're notes. That's the worst part of it. You can't turn them off. 500 different compiler flags in GCC, G++, Clang. There are no options for disabling these stupid things. So, uh, yeah, if you get these things, this is the infamous template substitution error in C++ and is one of the reasons why uh, people think that you should not teach C++ to newbies because you get these error messages. If you try to see out a vector, you get 429 lines of errors. Uh, <clears throat> so why? Great question. There is no good answer. Um, I don't think that they're useful if you want to take a look at these error messages. Um, Okay, in file included from here and here and here. Note candidate uh, has a deleted uh, double left arrow operator. Complete ar argument deduction substitution failed. Cannot convert a vector. Cannot convert vect, which is a stood vector of integers, to a const char32 pointer. So what this is telling you is that it tried converting a vector to a, um, a pointer, a constant pointer to 32-bit characters and it didn't work. And you're like, I didn't think it would work. Why would you try that? But no, 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 it's not done. It's gonna tell you every single thing it tried converting it to. We tried converting it to a Unicode string. I tried converting it to a, a regular const char star. I tried converting it to a signed const char star. I tried converting it to this. I tried converting it to that. It's gonna try every single bloody thing it can possibly think of and tell you about it. I don't want to know because these things don't work. Why would you even think that it's okay to convert a vector to um, null pointer? Like, why? Why would? Why? Why are you even trying that? You know, like, why are you trying to convert a vector of integers to a null? Pointer? Like, why? And and the fact that it didn't work does not surprise me. It shouldn't work. I don't need any of this information. None of, no known conversion from a vector to a void star. No known conversion from a vector of integers to float. I know. 
I know, I wasn't trying to print a float. I was trying to print a vector of integers. None of this is useful. This is my single greatest peeve with C++ right now. And it is entirely the compiler people's fault. Because they're like, all they need to give me is a flag where I'm like, turn this stupid stuff off. Like, I, I've literally found the place in GCC w that generates these things. And they're, the last time I checked, at least, there is no flag for you to just turn them off, which makes no sense because they are utterly, utterly useless. I've never once looked at one of these things and been like, oh, well, that's the problem. It was trying to convert from a vector of integers to a long, long unsigned integer. That's why it didn't, like, never. I've been programming professionally in C++ for a really long time. This has never once, not once, ever been useful. Uh, the only, I mean, I, I guess it's useful that it's doing is trying to convert a vector to something. But none of these attempted conversions are in any way useful at all. It's trying literally vector of integers to Boolean, uh, vector of integers to long int. Literally everything it knows how to print out, it's trying. And we get 400 lines of error messages from this. So the only thing that is useful is at the very top. So the very top error, no match for a double left arrow operator. Uh, operand types are O stream and vector of integers. Boom. This is actually the problem. Good. Good job, G. This is actually the problem. It has no match for operator double left arrow. And maybe you don't know what that what that means, right? Like maybe you don't know what operand types mean, and maybe you don't know why there's an operator double left arrow or something like that. That's okay. You can ask me. Like that's actually Bjarni Struestrup's official answer when I asked him. I'm like, hey, compiler errors kind of suck for students. Like, how do you how do you teach them? And he's like, you should just have your students ask you. So there you go. Blessed upon I from Barney Struestrup himself. Uh, if you guys have any questions about an error message, just post a question. You can screenshot this. You know, what the hell does this mean? And I'll tell you. All of these notes and things like that, don't ask me. Because you know what? They're pointless. They are all pointless. All of them. Never once has it, it ever been useful in 30 years. Okay? So I'm sure somebody has some reason like, oh, well, I thought it would convert to an int, but it didn't. Like, why would you, why would you try to convert? I, I, I don't know. Anyway, so here is the actual stuff. So if you've got 429 lines of error messages, because it is 429 somewhere, you can actually show one line of one, uh, sorry, page of errors at a time by doing this. So if you pipe the output of your code, including standard error, into a program called less, less will show you one page of errors at a time, okay? And this is actually pretty useful. You can actually scroll up and down, and uh, uh, it, it's called a pager. It not like a beep, beep, you know, kind of pager, but like it shows one page of text at a time, okay? And you can use that to show the, you can scroll up in it and take a look here at the actual error message. Another approach you can take is to pipe it through head. So head is a Unix uh, utility that shows you the top 10 lines of a file. So that's usually where the error is. <laughs> <coughs> so rather than having to scroll up, and if you've tried compiling it multiple times, you might actually have like thousands of errors in your console and it's just garbage. Um, just pipe the result, including error. That's what the ampersand means there. It means uh, pipe the standard error, which is what all of your compiler errors come out on, into head. And head shows you the top 10 lines of that. Uh, you can adjust that. I think it's like dash n 20 or something like that. Then it shows you like the top 20 lines, but usually top 10 is good enough. So just pipe the output through head. And that's usually your mistake. And that's actually reasonable. They have gotten a lot better. No match for a double arrow operator. Boom, 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 boom. You lose colors though, that's a downside. So. Okay, uh, if you declare a function variable, never use it, it gives you a cayenne note. Uh, if you have, now I think that's actually a warning. It's like, let's make a function here. <clears throat> Integer is C. And we'll get rid of U. Uh, G plus plus, main dot CC. Uh, that is mm, dash warn all. Warn extra. 
I think I have those the same one. There we go. Yeah. Actually, uh, one really good advice is to not have any warnings at all. Listen to every warning because there are warnings out there that will absolutely bite you in the ass if you don't listen to them. There's only three warnings that I'll sometimes disable. This is one of them. So when I'm doing development, if I haven't used a parameter yet, it's like, I know. I know. I'm getting to it. You know, it's a warning because um, it's a warning because if you like are releasing your code like that, this is not good. Right? Tipton, do you see why this is not good? No, this isn't good code? Where does C appear in the function here? Exactly. If this is my release code, this is bad. Because I made a parameter and I forgot to use it. So the warning is there for a reason. But uh, when I'm doing development, like I'll, I'll sometimes just like, you know, I'll make some variables, you know, you know, integer X, Y, Z or whatever. And like, I just haven't gotten around to using them yet. And if you do that, you're going to unuse variable warnings, unuse parameter warnings. I turn those off by, by default because I don't forget to use them. Um, and it's just annoying for me to have all these warnings popping up when it's like, yeah, I know, I know. Chill. Give me a second, you know. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, those warnings I disable. Um, another warning you might disable is like conversion between an unsigned and assigned integer, but you really probably should leave that one on because your code will break if your number is bigger than two billion. Um, so, yeah. Uh, basically, other than unused war unused parameter warnings and unused variable warnings, uh, I turn on every warning and I pay attention to them. And I don't let any warnings go into my code. Okay. So, um, yeah, no errors, no warnings. Uh, notes, though, yeah, notes only seem to appear like in these template substitution errors like this. And they're all worthless. Just all of them are. And there's... Like you can turn off warnings, but you can't turn off notes. They're less useful than warnings and you can't turn them off. So there, there's like some weird hacks you can do um, that like have a side effect of like disabling notes or something, but like there's no just like comment, like just compile flag, like no notes, please. Unless they've added it. It's something that I keep like, like, pestering them about like I'll I'll mention it to them when they ask you know like hey what changes would you like I'm like I would like the ability to turn off these useless things that flood my screen with error messages that don't do anything so who knows one day one day we'll get rid of those things all right so uh logic errors all right so logic errors are like your code compiles so that separates them from a compilation error right these are called runtime errors, right? You have compiler errors, you have runtime errors, right? So what's wrong with this code? There's three different bugs in the code on the screen here. I'll give you guys a moment. I'll enjoy the last of this caramel macchiato, double iced Starbucks. There are three lethal bugs on the screen. Well, I don't know if lethal is the right word, but there's three bugs on the screen. Let's see if you can find them. I did not actually get this. This was a present. X will never equals one. Hmm. You would think, but you'd be wrong there. X will, in fact, equal one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what we got here, and Otal, very good job with that. Uh, one equal sign is assignment, two equal signs is comparison. So the person who wrote this probably thought in their head, oh, if x equals one, and they write it this way. This code, however, is bad. This is actually setting x equal to one. Now, what value does that return? Is x equals one true or is it false? 
What value is returned by the expression x equals 1? Anyone know? If you have x equals 40, what value gets returned? Forty. Whenever you do an assignment, it actually returns the value that was assigned. Is forty true or false? True. So is this code true or false? It is true. And so looking at the code, you would think that this code would always print goodbye world because x is seven, x is not equal to one, so it should print goodbye world. But when you run it, it prints out hello world instead. And then you change the value of x here to be 40, to be one, to be zero. And no matter what value you change x to, it always prints hello world. And you get really, really frustrated at it, okay? So goodbye world sounds like a metal song. Yeah, I mean, that's the trouble with uh, hello world, right? Is that the world never writes back. If c equals a, c out. So this is actually valid C++. Now, you're going to get a warning on it because this is such a common um, error, runtime error. It's not a compiler error. It's valid C++ that you will actually get a warning on it because uh, so many people have screwed this one up over the years. It'll actually warn. But it compiles. It's actually valid C++ code. Um, valid C code as well. Uh, but Pay attention to your warnings, okay? So, people always say hello world, but they never say how is world. <laughs> it's funny, right? So, uh, what are the other bugs on here? Anyone know? This, there's actually two compiler errors. It's a shake in the uh, espresso. Sugar-free, yeah. Although, sugar-free sounds like you would add sugar and then take it out, but it's just espresso and milk. No curly braces? You would think, right? Somebody in the in-person session said, oh, you need curly braces. Nope. Uh, remember the rule for curly braces. You do not need them, technically. Some professors will say, always put curly braces there. Um, I don't, I don't, eh. I'm agnostic on the matter. Um, this code is correct though. You do not need curly braces if you have exactly one line of code. If you have exactly one line of code following an else or an if or an else if, else if, each one of those branches can have one line of code in them. If you want to have more lines of code, if you want to print out hello world twice or something, then you need the curly boys. Okay. You always put them, you must use the curly braces. Yeah. You always put them. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things, right? It's like, you know, people have been burned by not putting them in, but putting them in doesn't burn you. Um, right? Like, like I could, you know, I could write code like this, you know? And if I wanted to, like, see out the value of A every time, um, it won't work because I don't have the curly braces there, right? I would need curly braces if I want to see out all the things, which is, how you solve runtime errors. Like this code here is buggy. If you want to view, um, you know, the, the results as it runs, you see out all the things. If you don't have curly boys, then this looks like it's part of the for loop. Look, doesn't that look like it? Look at the indentation. For Python programmers, Python programmers are like, there you go. It's part of the for loop. It's indented. Look, it's part of the for loop. Um, <laughs> uh, include IO stream. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, no, I, I usually, uh, I mean, technically you're, you're right. Um, it doesn't have a for loop, but no, that's not the problem. Um, warning, this for clause does not guard misleading indentation. This for clause does not guard this statement, but the latter, the latter is misleadingly indented as if it was guarded by the for. So the compiler is giving us a warning on this. Like I said, they have gotten really good at their warnings. Like I am very pleased with how good uh, G++ and Clang++ have gotten over the years. Uh, there's still a long way to go though with the template substitution errors. So yeah, if you misleadingly indent something, it will warn you. Pay attention to your warnings, they mean something. So yeah, some people will slap a curly brace around everything just 
because um, I personally don't a lot of times. I like the look of something like this. Right? You guys see this down here? One line of code for every element x in the vector, see how that element. To me, that is easy to read, easy to write. You don't have like you don't have all this like stuff scrolling off the screen. Just boom, there it is. To me, that is nice looking code. That is that is some good looking code right there. Some people will disagree with that. Everyone like people will find issues with everything you have, but to me that looks really nice. So uh, yes, the quotes very good, Dermer. So the problem here is if I were to just copy this code here, is that if I were to just copy and paste this, this code actually will not compile. And the reason for that is because um, this is a smart quote. Uh, it is not a vertical quote. C++ only works with vertical quotes. You see the difference here? The vertical quote works fine, but the smart quote does not work. So just be aware of that if you uh, try copying and pasting from my PowerPoint presentations that you might have to um, replace using R and then double quote. Um, you can replace the smart quotes with vertical quotes that are proper. Okay. So uh, yeah, both of these strings are invalid. Okay. So. So how do you how do you how do you find your logic bugs, right? Like how do you test your stuff? Like this is a big topic, like testing. Like we'll probably have a whole lecture on, on testing. But how do you how do you test your stuff? And and like especially when you have like a giant program, like we've got all this stuff going on, you know, what a lot of students don't know how to do is just test like one thing. Like just one thing. And they'll run like input tester and that runs all these things, right? It's testing, you know your rectangle and your circles and like all these things are happening. Um, no, you need to write a little bit of code. You need to write like this much code at a time, like four or five lines of code maybe max. And then you need to test it. So how do you test it? You do it like this. You come into main. We got all of main down there with all these vectors and arrays and stuff like that. Watch this. I'm going to make a new bra named B because I don't know how to name variables. Um, print strings everywhere. Yeah, but watch this. B dot exponent. I want to compute two to the third power. Okay, I'll just see out B two to the third power. But if I do this, it's still going to be like running all that code uh, down below. Uh, does it take a third parameter? And we'll get rid of those items. Okay. Now watch this. Quit. I'm just test my main now. It just makes a new bra. It calls the function, prints out the result, and quits. That's it. Boom. Okay. I do not need to run all the rest of my code with all the, uh, you know, opening up files and processing. Nope. This code now, uh, I've created what's called a driver. Uh, it is a little, tiny little main that all it does is it makes a class and it tests the one little thing that I'm working on. And then when I'm done, I can just be like, bloop, and back to, you know, back to where I was before, okay? It's very common for me to just make little, little, little test programs and things like that, and then I'm gonna run it, and I got 256 as the answer when I was expecting it to be eight, okay? So see out all the things, yep, print strings everywhere, yep. So let's try this, okay? So uh, see out all the things. So see out i is equal to i, and a is equal to a, and b is equal to b, and I think that's everybody. Um, I forget something in the line, thank you. Okay. And then see out final result. Hey, hey, right. hey. And so now when I run it, I can now view my code as it runs. Okay. 
um, Lex uh, Friedman uh, gave a, uh, a great interview with uh, John Carmack a couple months ago. And John Carmack says, our, our internal human brain makes for a very bad computer. It does not simulate code very well. And so every time John Carmack, who is a god among men, among programmers, he's honestly one of my personal heroes. If he doesn't think that his brain's smart enough to simulate the code correctly, then, you know, what, what chance do I have? What chance do you guys have at simulating code correctly? So what you do is you just run it and just watch it. Uh, Carmack prefers debuggers. I'll show you guys how to do that in a second. But I like see outing all the things because it's fast. You just And you just watch this. Like, that's my entire program. Main does not exist beyond this point. All my main does is it creates a bra, it calls a function on it, and I get a look at the results and see if I screwed up, which I did. Okay? So, it, it hurts. Yeah, but, like, trust me. Like, you, you know... The, the human brain is not good at being a computer. It's really not. Like, that's why we have to spend years training ourselves to become programmers, right? Because it's not natural for us. Like, it's natural for us to, like, eat. Like, you don't have to go to college to, like, learn how to eat a cheeseburger, you know? You don't have to go to college to, like, I don't know, comb your hair or something like that. Like, it's not natural for us to be computers. All right, so first time through the loop, A is 2, B is 3. Second time through the loop, a is four, B is three, and then, oh, it squared the square. Uh, okay. All right, and this is probably a problem that came up for a lot of you guys on imaginary homework. So let's do this. Integer total equals one. And then we will say total times equals A, and we're gonna return total. And we're gonna print out total. And we're gonna see out Total somewhere, let's see here, okay. Okay. And this is how you write code. Like you wanna spend as little time as possible debugging, right? So uh, if you just stare at the code, you're like, I don't know why it's not working. Well, that's not a very productive uh, approach. Randomly changing things is not a productive approach. You should run your code, output all the things, look at it, Write down on a piece of paper, all right, if I square it, it should be this. Okay, so the first time through the loop, total was one. So if we say two to the zeroth power, it's one. Two to the first power is two. Two to the second power is four. And then I didn't print out, I guess, after the, the thing, but the final result is eight. That looks good. All right, let's try a couple other things, right? So I'm going to come down to my stub function here. Let's compute three to the, I don't know, fifth power. Why not? And then you should also test it for other things as well. Negative numbers, like what happens if you have a negative exponent? What happens if you have a zero exponent? What happens if you have um, zero to the zeroth power? You have, like once your code is working, and maybe even before your code is working, you need to think about all the different ways it could break also and test those as well in your driver. Okay, so three to the fifth power is, uh, uh, that does not look right to me, right? So again, three. Wait, no, 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 we're not doing five to the third power. We're doing three to the fifth. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. That, yeah, cool, 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 cool. All right. Our code's correct, right? Well, three to the negative fifth. One wrong, right? What about zero to the zeroth power? One I don't know, it's undefined technically. So, but do you, do you guys see what I'm getting at here? Like you just sit there, you just kind of like work at it and work at it and work at it. And you look at you look at the code, you sit down with a piece of paper. Um, the John Carmack way is this, g++ dash g cc. I'm turning off uh, the optimizer. The backslash here means uh, don't use my alias because I have an alias set up for g++ that turns the optimizer on. The optimizer will straight up delete my code. <laughs> you don't want to use the debugger when your code is uh, deleted. It is very hard to debug deleted code, as it turns out. Okay, so GDB out out, TUI enable. Uh, so here's our code. And so I want to set a breakpoint on line 51, it looks like. Breakpoint line 51. And then we're going to hit run. And then when we get to line 51, it stops. And this is how Carmack does his code. So. 
we're going to step into the function and we could do things like watch total. So every time total changes, it's going to print uh, the change and we can go step and uh, it tells us uh, value of A is three, value of B is five, step, uh, print value of I if we want. We can type next, next goes over the output statement, it prints it out, next again. And you can see here, as it's going through, every time total changes, it tells us the update. Uh, I don't know, the screen got screwed up there. Um, next, total times equals A, so we can print the value of A, we can print the value of total. And you just sit there and you can step through your code and make sure that what it's doing is what you think. It's also a great way of learning how a computer runs your code. Because a lot of students don't really understand for loops, you know, like they kind of do, but like you can actually just sit there and like watch the, um, you can actually watch it run through the loop, you know, and you can print the value of I each time. You can print the value of B and print the value of A. Um, you can watch, you can have watch points set up like this. And you know it'll it'll sit there and and run and then when it finishes it'll print the results and uh, then return the total and then it's gonna see out the thing two hundred forty three and then it quits okay and then it calls the destructor okay then we're dead we're in the afterlife now all right so GDB allows you to step through your code and look at all the values and. And you can you can sit there and see if if the things are working correctly, right? Did you write your for loop correctly? What do you guys think? What do you like better? Just give me your honest opinion. Do you guys like uh, C out better or do you like um, GDB better? They effectively do the same thing. Like they can watch the values over time. Um, I I personally uh, use C out, but you know Carmack likes GDB. I also I also do use GDB. Like I'm not a hater or anything but I, I just feel like when i run it like i just get all the i get all the data like immediately Boop. so i don't have to sit there and step through everything and look at everything although that sort of deliberateness does let you see kind of what's going on with more detail so see out gdb they're both good they're both very powerful um very helpful in situations like this where you've got x equals zero y equals two so everybody, we're going to see out all the things, okay? So as as we're going along, we've got our logic, uh, we got a logic bug somewhere in here. And so what we do is just every step along the way, we're going to be printing out the values. Again, ignore the smart quotes. Thank you, PowerPoint, for doing that. So what's it going to print here? So on the first line here, it's going to say x equals x and y equals y. What value is going to be printed for x and y? Put your answers now up on Discord. It's going to print x equals 0, y equals 2. Very good. All you guys got that. All right. What about this one? x is equal to 2 times x plus 2 times y. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Y didn't change. So x is equal to 2 times x. That's 2 times 0. That's 0, plus 2 times 2 is 4, 0 plus 4 is 4, x is now 4, and y is now 2, still. Okay. All right, now what about this line? x is equal to 2 times x plus plus times 2 times y. This is valid C++. plus plus. Somehow. What is this going to print for x equals x and y equals y? X is 80, Y is 2. You see what I'm saying about your mental computer not like 0 and 2? So X is 4, right? So 2 times X is 8. We then post increment X after the command is run. Uh, and then we're multiplying 8 times 2 times Y, which is 4. So 8 times 4 is 32. And then we're post-incrementing it, so maybe it's 33, I don't know. Like, this is why you need to step through things or see out all the things, because your brain isn't capable of simulating with fidelity source code, right? We think we can, but we can't.
Okay. So the plus plus takes place first. Nope, this is the postfix plus plus. So this plus plus takes place after all that code runs. So it's effectively like I had written two times x times two times y, x equals all that, and then x plus plus. But there's actually a timing issue in here, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a bit. And then we're going to set y equal to x equal to x plus 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 y. What value is x going to have? What value is y going to have? This is valid C++. What's your final answer? What's x going to be? What It's just algebra. Can't be that difficult, right? Job security code, for sure. In fact, Hazleton, you're actually not wrong about this. This code right here is what got me my job at the college. So uh, when I applied to become the tenured, you know, full-time, whatever, uh, professor here, uh, they gave me an option of five different topics, one of which was like pointers, one was on like linked lists, one of which was the prefix and postfix operator in C++, adding one to a number. And so I was like, I bet nobody is doing that one. So I stood up in front of the... Uh, the hiring panel, and I said, all right, I've got 15 minutes to teach you guys how to add one to a number. Let's do this. And by the end of it, like I had the, I had like up on the screen, like this literal thing right here, and they figured it out, you know, X plus 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 Y, you know, and they were like parsing it and they're like, wow, I hate computer science now. Thank you so much. <laughs> <coughs> I never want to do computer science again. No, no they thought it was hilarious. Like they, they knew I was kind of, you know, having fun. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is not just job security code. This is literally what got me hired to be a professor. So I have a special place in my heart for it right here. Um, <clears throat> so nobody has any answers. What's the final verdict going to be for X and Y? All right, 35 and 35, anyone, nobody, nobody took it? Yeah, and that's why we see out all the things. That's why we run it through GDB and see what's actually happening here. Okay. Now we're almost out of time. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about Byzantine errors. Byzantine errors are when your code behaves unpredictably. And these are almost always caused by uninitialized variables, buffer overruns, uh, other kinds of undefined behavior like that, okay? So uh, this code here looks like you're concatenating hello world and goodbye world, and so it should just print hello world, goodbye world. And in fact, it does print that, and then it prints RAM, and then it seg faults and crashes sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes it works. That's the scary part. What's happening here, and I'm not going to run you guys through it because we're kind of out of time. <clears throat> is that it concatenates these, this text here to the end of this array here. In C, these are C arrays. Every array of a string of character is a string array is ended with a special null character that indicates it's the end of the string. When you stir cat it like this, it overwrites that null character and writes over RAM for some other variables that it doesn't belong to and puts a null character at the end of that. So these other variables that it doesn't belong which might have your social security number in it, your phone number. If they write to that, that null character might get erased. And so the scary thing is this code will actually work maybe the first time you print it. It might work because you just overwrote all this stuff. There's an old character there. It'll print hello world, goodbye world, done. Half an hour later, you go to print it again. It kills your program. It's like a living time bomb in your code, because once that null character gets erased, if there doesn't happen to be another zero in memory for a while, it could very well just print all of RAM. Uh, these are huge security issues, by the way. It's printing all, all everybody's social security numbers and telephone numbers and things like that. Um, you can, uh, buffer overflows are a big uh, security issue for dumping. Uh, it is a buffer overflow. Yes, it is. And, uh, and if, you allow people remotely on the internet to do this, they can compromise your server and take it over. Uh, it's extremely dangerous. And this is one of the reasons why I highly recommend 
not using C. Um, and if you're using C++, not using C style arrays. Like C style arrays have been responsible for more hacks than like anything else over the years. Um, use the string class. Don't use C++ strings. Strings in C are garbage. Like use C++ string class. Don't use these things. Um, yeah, imagine trying to withdraw 12, you get a receipt for the bank's password. Uh, once, yeah, I withdrew like 200 bucks and the bank didn't record it. That was kind of interesting. Um, I, I went to like Wells Fargo, tried pulling money out. It's like, you don't have any money. This is college. I was poor. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I got money. So I tried a different bank. It's like, no, you don't have any money. So I went to another bank and tried pulling money out and it gave me 200 bucks. I'm like, sweet. I went to REI, bought my tent and uh, went camping in Kings Canyon. And when I came back, I was like, checking my bank account. It's like, wait, I didn't have the, wait, what happened? No record of the withdrawal. No cash. I was like, what's going on? So I called Wells Fargo and I'm like, Hey, I, I pulled money out of my account. And it's not showing it. And they were like rude to me. They're like, that is impossible, sir. If you pulled money out of the account, it would show up. I was like, all right. I mean, I did, but sir, our systems are foolproof. Okay. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> cool. I, I guess I got a free tent. I still have it too. Um, so yeah, this is a, this is a great example of how you can have code that looks like it works. And then half an hour later, it explodes your code. My most famous uh, Byzantine error. Byzantine error is a bug that is unpredictable. Sometimes it's called a Heisen bug. You look at it and it vanishes. You stop looking and it reappears. Um, the uh, the worst bug that I ever had in my life was a crash caused by a comment. I had a comment causing my code to crash. I would put the comment in. It would work. I would take the comment out. It would crash. And I'd be like, what? And I'd put it in, it'd work. I'd take it out, it'd crash. Repeatedly. What the hell is happening here? And it took me about a week to find the thing. And it, uh, yeah, long story short, it had nothing to do with the comment. Like the comment actually didn't have anything to do with anything. What was happening was I had an uninitialized pointer. And so some of the time the pointer was um, initialized to null. Apparently, when the comment was there, the pointer was just randomly given a value of null. And when uh, the comment wasn't there, the pointer was not given a value of null. It was just whatever was in RAM. And so probably that comment caused, you know, whatever was in RAM. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, that spent, I spent a week on that, trying to hunt that, that, that one down. Because the pointer that was not initialized was nowhere near the comment, right? I just had code. I commented it. I, out of habit, hit compile, hit run, and it crashed. And I went, the what now? <laughs> All I did was add a comment, you know, like, or maybe I had it backwards, whatever. Uh, but the, uh, you know, maybe I deleted a comment or something. It doesn't matter. The point is, like, I didn't change anything, like, meaningful. I was just messing with comments, and when I recompiled, it would crash. And then I'd revert it, and then it would work. And then I'd put it back in, and it would crash. And uh, yeah, uninitialized variables are the devil. Do not have any uninitialized primitives anywhere in your code. Use constructors for all of your things. Don't use C style arrays. They are garbage. Don't use C style strings. They are worse than garbage. They are a dumpster fire. Okay. So uh, displayed all of them. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that is what I call quantum computing. Yeah. It, Byzantine errors. Like there's a reason why I'm balding up top here, right? Because I ripped all my hair out trying to trying to hunt these things down. All right. So, uh, basically, long story short, always initialize your variables. Don't use C style arrays. Use dot at instead of square brackets. Then you got bounds checking. When you can't go out of bounds, when you don't have any undefined behavior in your code like that, you're good to go. It's a much much nicer world to live in. The C plus plus world, the modern C plus plus world, where you got predictability and bounds checking and things like that is just a better world than SeaWorld, okay? So on that note, uh, there's a Zybux, there's a competency exam. Get cracking on those. We'll talk about your next programming assignment on Wednesday. Peace out.